So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Carmen Varela for joining me today for an interview with the neuroscientist. Uh, I'm, I'm Matt Taylor from the Minta. This is again the interview with the neuroscientist series. Um, Dr. Varela is from MIT, currently mm -hmm. working there as That's a right. research scientist mm -hmm. at the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. How long have you been there? It's been quite some time, uh, um, almost 10 years. Uh, really? Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you enjoy working at that institute? I like it. Yeah, yeah, it's a good place to be. Great. And, and so we'll talk about some of the research, I think, that you've been involved in there. But mm -hmm. how, has it, how has the field changed since you got into it over 10 years ago? Hmm. It, so so it, it's been changing quite a bit. And I, I, I guess the, one of the main things that I've been a witness to is the increase in the number of techniques that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, when I was a graduate student, we didn't have optogenetics, for example. And there wasn't a good method to specifically modify the activity of cells and be able to dissect what specific cells within a circuit are doing for behavior. Yeah, the idea here is that you can introduce a protein that is light sensitive into a cell of interest and that will give you access to manipulate the activity of that cell either increasing the, the probability of fighting, of spiking, mm -hmm. or blocking the activity of that cell. And so you can now determine what the contribution of that specific cell that you might be interested in is right. in, a, in a particular behavior. That's really interesting. Surgical very powerful. precision somewhat. And they use viruses in some ways to deliver these, right? That is correct. So there are a number of ways in which you can get the light sensitive protein into the cells of interest. But uh, commonly, and in my research, we do that. We use a viral vector that will have the gene for the particular protein, mm -hmm. either an excitatory or an inhibitory protein. Um, and so by infusing the viral vector into an area, brain region of interest, we let the viral vector do its work, infect the cells, mm -hmm. and introduce that genetic um, modification into, into whatever circuit we are interested in studying. It, it gives you access to a very precise uh, manipulation of cell activity mm -hmm. because now you're working with light and so that adds another component to it. You have millisecond precision uh, to introduce new spikes if you wanted to mm -hmm. or to remove particular patterns of activity. And so you get the genetic specificity to target certain cells in the brain uh -huh. but you also have millisecond control over them and this is the time frame in which we think uh, you know, many of the computations in the brain are happening. So, so it's, it's been, yeah. So this doesn't incredible. just help, um, uh, you know, because there, there's some ways you can dissect the brains uh, after some experiments and find things, but this helps even during live experiments then too, right? That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. Okay. So for people like me that are trying to understand things like cognitive behavior, cognitive function, mm -hmm. it is the precise uh, manipulation that you would want to have as the animal model may be engaged in a particular yeah, behavior. Yeah, doing something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, yeah, it seems to be an exciting time to be in neuroscience mm -hmm. because there's just so much going on. The fields are moving very quickly. Um, there are some specific things that I wanted to ask you about, uh, Dr. Varela. the folder full of topics that we'll go over and uh, so <clears throat> one of them would just be brain waves okay uh, which should be fun to talk about um, come on dad just five more minutes <laughs> which is what my kids say to me every time I wake I them up in the morning uh -huh. <laughs> uh, the blackboard in your brain mm, interesting uh -huh. And uh, daily journal. And these all have something to do with the brain or brain parts or something. So, okay, um, we'll find out. Do you, would you like to choose choose one? You may or may not know which what the topic is. I am gonna let you choose. I'm gonna. Well, let's talk about brain waves first. Okay. That's the, that's the one I'm on. Or oscillations. Mm -hmm. that's another way of saying it. I think this is really interesting because it because it, it you can see it as a sort of a signal analysis problem see, see the brain and all the things that are going on inside of it as this signal analysis problem which are mm -hmm. those are hard problems to solve you know mm -hmm. but uh, but what intrigues me especially is 
How, where do the where do these oscillations come from? What is originating mm -hmm. them? That's the that's the hard question. I think maybe I'm diving right to the hardest question. Yeah. But may, do you have any insight about that? Yeah. Well, so the yeah, you, you kind of have to think about the techniques that we use to uh, record this particular signal that is is interesting to us for a number of reasons, and that is that we uh, often record these oscillations by monitoring the voltage potential in electrodes that we place into the brain. Mm -hmm. and, and so these um, oscillatory patterns that we see in the voltage that is recorded by these electrodes is actually a reflection of what's going on at the population level mm -hmm. in the cells that surround the electrode. Right. And so we are, we are talking about, you know, we record an electrical field that might be rhythmic, that may have some pattern to it, but really this is interesting because it's a marker of, of what's going on in the cell population, in the cells that are surrounding that electrode. Mm -hmm. and so if you imagine um, a group of cells, all of them becoming active for a particular period of time, that is going to drive the electrical field recorded by that electrode in one particular direction. If all of those cells become inactive in the next moment in time, then all of the, the electrical field is going to be driven in the opposite direction. Mm. And so if you imagine this going on, um, at certain frequencies, that's what's going to originate the rhythmicity that we observe as an oscillatory pattern at different mm -hmm. frequencies, uh, depending on the task at hand. Um, but, but that's the, you know, the, the usefulness of it, the fact that it's reflecting something that happens mm -hmm. at, the, at the level of cell populations being either in sync or out of sync or coordinated right. in some interesting way. Because if you look at just one signal, or, or, or a, an EKG saying that a, a node that's attached to just one part of the brain or, or just one small population of cells, mm -hmm. and you look at the, the oscillation there, mm -hmm. there's a lot, there's actually many signals there, mm -hmm. right? It's a combination of a bunch of things that could be happening in that group of that's neurons. Right. And yeah. so the, the challenge is figuring out what different populations of neurons might exactly. be doing different yeah. tasks or different things. That's correct. Because yeah, yeah. each different oscillation, each different frequency, whatever, could be a different thing happen, a different process, right? Right, yeah. Uh, do we know what those processes might even be? Does that represent ideas or thoughts or intentions? Well, yeah, there are, attention? Right, or what, what do they mean in yeah. the end, right, for the, for the population at hand? Um, and so we, there are some ideas in the field of what like, particular frequency bands could correspond to. Mm -hmm. I think a general uh, process across the oscillatory patterns and regardless of the frequency, the specific frequency of an oscillation, is that uh, dif different parts of the oscillation may correspond to communication between cells. Mm. And so one of the general things that, that may happen um, in, in different frequency bands is that at particular phases of the oscillatory cycle, you may have communication between different parts of the brain. Mm. And so in the hippocampus, this is something that has some evidence to it. Uh, we think that some of the predominant oscillatory patterns during uh, wakefulness mm -hmm. may correspond to the, the gating of information into certain networks of the hippocampus uh, for you know, encoding of information or for retrieval of information. The hippocampus is involved with memory, but there are different components to memory. And so different uh, stages of that oscillatory activity could correspond to either encoding of information mm. or retrieval of information. Oh, interesting. Or so it can help organize um, those cognitive functions that a particular network like the hippocampus. So is you're talking about within the period of a wave. That's correct. Right? There, there may be different things happening. In, in one in one part of the wave versus the other part of the wave. That's right. We've kicked around this idea here about there being like an inference part of, of a wave and then a uh, a learning part. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. there may be two cycles of the oscillation. You know, mm -hmm. the cells trying to predict what's happening next and then and then uh, try, trying to learn what has previously just happened. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and so for the, you know, to follow up with that, for the functions of the hippocampus, that, that's kind of the, is one of the demands that's, that some cognitive functions will have. Mm -hmm. and, and if you think about an animal uh, moving in, 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 in its environment, you, you, it, it, if there is a goal to that behavior, the animal has to keep in mind the goal, right? Mm -hmm. There is a working memory component to yeah. it. You're, yeah. you're, you're doing some behavior, you have to remember 
uh, what your final goal or destination it's is. It's not just about what's around the corner, it's about what's at the end of the maze. Later on, yeah. right? So yeah. there is some, some temporal dynamics to that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're encoding information of everything that is surrounding you. Uh, you, you don't lose awareness of what's in your surroundings. So there is an encoding uh, process that is happening at the same time as, as the, the working memory process. Right. And so we think that to prevent interference between these two processes, uh, you, you need to separate them slightly, and that will happen within the cycle within of a oscillation. particular oscillation. Interesting. So, so it sort of brings us to uh, one of the other topics I want to talk about, which I call daily journal. Okay. Which uh, you brought up the hippocampus, uh -huh. and, and from what I've read about, I'm no hippocampus expert, but from what I've read, one of the possible reasons it may exist is to sort of be be this storage area or some type of short-term storage area for your daily activities. You know, building up the state of, of, of where you are and what's happening in the world every day, mm -hmm. and and then almost like resetting and starting over. You know, mm -hmm. and so you're constantly holding this strong sense of memory with you as you walk through life that right. drops off every, you know, maybe 24, 48 hours, who knows, but yeah. uh, is that a good idea of what the hippocampus really might be well, doing? Well, yes, so, so, so we do think that the hippocampus is an important component of a memory system, um, and in particular, the hippocampus is a rapid memory system, but mm -hmm. a short-term memory system. Like if you were like to your... memorize like seven numbers, that's where right. they would go. So right. it would be important, right? It yeah. would not be the only region of the brain that is involved in this, but, but it is true that if, if there is damage to the hippocampus, then you, you're not going to be able to even acquire that memory even for a short period of time. Yeah, you can't make and new memories. That's right. right. New episodic memories will be completely gone. Right. And, and so there, there are a number of things that, that make the hippocampus a good uh, network structure, a good brain structure for this. And one of it is that it, it has the plasticity rules and the, the, the synapses uh, that, that have the dynamics that, that allow for that. And what I mean with that is that it's a structure that can form associations quickly. Hmm. And so there are a lot of recurrent connections and there are plastic synapses mm -hmm. that will have the capacity to, you know, online, right, like form that new memory trace as, as you're going through that episode. And, and we think that later on the, the hippocampus is going to transfer this memory to other uh, brain structures that are also important learning and memory systems, but that may not have the, the synaptic plasticity or, or the learning rules to mm -hmm. encode information so quickly, as quickly as yeah. the hippocampus so can the do. The hippocampus is fast and plastic. Uh -huh. uh, and so it's, it's, it's sort of scratch pad type memory, I don't know. <laughs> yes, like a short term memory. Yeah, very short term storage. memory. And so how does, I, I hate to keep jumping ahead to, but this, this all flows really well. <laughs> Into the other questions I was I was going to ask, this one was about sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we go to sleep at night, um, it seems like that it's a big reset. And do, how does that really like reset the hippocampus? When you wake up, are you waking up with a fresh set of a fresh scratch pad to use for your day? I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a it's a complete reset, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we think that the, the potential transfer of information that the, got stored in the hippocampus during the day is a slow process. And so it may not require uh, the, the one set of sleep, you know, one, oh. one. The transfer of information from hippocampal memory into more cortical memory. Right, into more permanently Permanent memory. stored memories. Uh, okay. That is a process that we think can take a fair amount of time, in fact, and it's like still... days, weeks, so, sort of, to... Depending on the type of memory and depending on your previous experience as mm -hmm. well with, with, you know, something similar to what you learned. Well, I guess we're f we can be faced with completely new scenarios constantly, mm -hmm. and they can take a good amount of time for us to adapt to, like, the new reality that, that we have, and that's something that you wouldn't just <laughs> immediately be able to right. do. Right, yeah, yeah. That makes it, sense. it can be a long process, mm -hmm. but... Uh, slowly and, and through through the oscillations that also happen during sleep, we, we think that eventually the, the memory traces can be transferred from the hippocampus to neocortex. So the oscillations that happen during sleep, I, I read somewhere that in the hippocampus, 
that there's actually there are lateral oscillations or there, there, there are oscillations that move a kind of along the length of the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. Is does that have anything to do with the the, temp, the way that temporal structures are stored in in that mm -hmm. part of the brain, or is that do we know why? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So there there is some pattern of uh, phase change as you move through the hippocampus. Of, of animals, but uh, I don't know that it has to do with the specifics, o other than the general organization of information that happens regardless of where you are in the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. I'm not completely sure if it has to do, or maybe I didn't understand exactly. No, I, I, it was a very obscure question, honestly. <laughs> and it's a hard question. I, a lot of these things we just don't know, and yeah. even the, the best of the best experts that we have, uh, we can come up with amazing questions that we just quite, can't quite answer yet. Yeah, we may not. Answer yeah, yet. but the, I mean, it's wonderful to look at the landscape of tools that is continuing to be developed uh, on in the neuroscience hardware. You know, the the brain monitoring and all of the new stuff that's coming out. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, it's an exciting time to be a, a neuroscientist. Um, yeah, we have all of these tools. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the last topic that I wanted to talk about, which I um, was about the blackboard mm -hmm. in your brain. Um, so you you passed. Uh, a couple papers to Subutai, which he passed to us and I read. Uh -huh. and I was very intrigued, I, I think it was by Marshall, right? The, the paper, mm -hmm. Dr. Yep. Marshall. Uh, it was a, an old paper, but it described the thalamus mm -hmm. as, as a blackboard. Oh, that's the Mumford, Mumford paper. Mumford, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was a paper from, uh, from Mumford about the thalamus. And, and, mm -hmm. and I, I don't usually use this. Jeff had a rubber band around this because he doesn't like the brain falling apart. Because that's what happens. <laughs> it's not it just, good. It's it's kind falls of falls apart. <laughs> But, but let me just show, that maybe you could show the thalamus. This is the kind of right. old midbrain. So that would be in the inner part of the brain, and we would have it um, around here. This is the interthalamic uh, commissure, actually, which has fibers that go across the two thalamic areas. But yeah, it's a small oval part of the brain, like literally at the center of your brain, mm -hmm. and uh, importantly connected with many and, and all of the neocortical regions and many of the cognitive areas of mm -hmm. the brain. So it's a hub of the forebrain, but it connected to, to every single cortical area. So I found I mean, that really brain. intriguing that mm -hmm. it was connected get, connected to, to you, know, you know, the whole all the rest of the cortex. Uh -huh. It's like this is just this is a really old part of the of the brain and the new brain grew around it and, and got just built in to mm -hmm. the old part. So I mean uh, part of that paper made me realize that you know the the, the place where v v1 projects to here is is uh, I mean the same relative area that your cortex is processing visual information too. So it kind of like these areas that process certain things on the cortex are are processing the same things here, uh -huh. which is interesting. Yeah, well, the processing in the neocortex has to be, you, you, you cannot think about how processing happens in the neocortex without thinking about the thalamus. That's the level of integration between the two structures. They happen to be physically uh, separated from each other, but mm -hmm. when we look at the synaptic level, they are as close as one synapse away. Yeah. And, and so yeah. it's it's... It really is, you know, the, 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 co the thalamus projecting to the neocortex and the neocortex projecting to the thalamus yeah. makes both of Constantly. them be the same functional the, structure. The, the really intriguing thing I thought was, um, so the, the, the nuclei in the thalamus mm -hmm. are not connected to each other. Is that right? For the most For part, the most there part, are very few They're strongly connected to its associating portion of the cortex. Right. But, but the thalamus isn't doing that much processing. Right? It's more of a, a relay or a synthesizer mm -hmm. or something? Well, that's one of the, the theories about thalamic function. We think about it as a, as a gateway to the neocortex, as one structure that may be there to control the, the transfer of that information, the relay of, of information to the neocortex. Mm -hmm. But one of the suggestions from Manford was that, in fact, the thalamus may be more actively involved in the processing of information, whereas uh, th this could be information from sensory areas, but also like higher order cognitive um, right. information processing. Right. And so the idea there is that the thalamus would provide a place where the cortex could send uh, predictions and try to match those predictions with the incoming input. Yeah. And because you have multiple thalamocortical loops, this yeah. could actually be happening at different um, processing levels, right? So it would not necessarily only be at the sensory level when mm -hmm. the, the 
the input goes through the thalamus for the first time, but then you have this input processed in the thalamocortical loop, then it can get to another part of the thalamus and go through a second round of processing right. that maybe now involves well, more, takes into account yeah. exactly additional it, information that has been uh, perhaps computed locally it's a, it's in the cortex. It's almost like, it's a little bit like feedback. You're getting an understanding of, okay, this portion of cortex is going to project back to the thalamus. This is what I think is going on. Right. And they're, all of right. them are doing that. And then the thalamus has that information. Mm -hmm. Right. In a way, it would be a, a way to separate the, the external information, which would remain always in the thalamus, you know, mm. which is driven by the sensory inputs directly, mm -hmm. to the predictions that might that the cortex may be implementing to compare, uh, to, to to compare what we already know or what we already learn mm -hmm. about particular sensory modalities to to the ongoing incoming input that the animal is receiving, that the, the sensory nuclei in the thalamus are receiving. Wow. That's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's much more than a, than a relay. I, it definitely is. You know, I, I, st I was looking at a bunch of diagrams of the thalamus, and this, this model just doesn't do it justice. I mean, I've never seen a brain dissected before, but it's really hard to get your head around what's going on in this thing right here right. because there's just so many little pieces to uh -huh. it, you know, and, the, and even you said the thalamus is in, inside of here, you know, in the corpus callosum yeah, it's a, on it's, top of it. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's right in the middle see. of the brain, but yeah, like you're pointing out, it's, it's interesting to think about its complexity because the local circuitry is relatively simple. Uh -huh. As you said, there aren't that many connections within the thalamic cells themselves, mm -hmm. um, but to understand the thalamus, you really have to think about functional circuits because there are excitatory relay cells, those are the main cells of the thalamus. There are inhibitory cells in the thalamic reticular nucleus. Mm -hmm. and, and those are the main connections that you have within the thalamus itself. But those relay cells contact the neocortex from some nuclei. There are cells in other nuclei that will contact the hippocampus. Mm. There are cells in those thalamic nuclei that will contact the striatum. They need to be affecting the, I mean, since it's projecting to the cortex in all these different places, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, as it's sort of building up its blackboard of what it thinks is going on in the world from all these different parts of the cortex, mm -hmm. then if, if it's not talking to itself, like if the different parts of the different nuclei aren't, aren't talking to themselves, mm -hmm. how does it, send that information back to the cortex from the other parts of yeah. the cortex. Right. So there are thalamocortical loops that get established, and that, that's the way in which you can still come back to the thalamus, mm -hmm. integrate it once more with whatever other information the thalamus is receiving, and then send it back again to the neocortex. In the same part of the neocortex, right? To the same part of the neocortex, but often down into the hierarchy, so down, okay. down yeah. through the hierarchy. Right. And so if right. you imagine the you know processing getting more and more complex as yeah. you go from the primary sensory areas to higher order cognitive regions, the thalamus will be involved in this hierarchical uh, processing. It's not only driven through corticocortical projections, but the loops through the thalamus are contributing uh, as well. So, so it's playing a role between regions and in cortical hierarchies as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And once you get to higher order cortical regions, I think another interesting thing happens in the sense that the thalamus can now engage cortex or regions of the brain beyond the neocortex. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine all of these you know, thalamocortical loops that happen through neocortical areas, mm -hmm. uh, at some point you get to the very high order regions like medial prefrontal cortex uh, and, 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 and these neocortical areas. But you also get, when, when you get to that point in the thalamus, you're also talking about parts of the thalamus that now connect to the hippocampus and they connect to the amygdala uh -huh. and they connect to the striatum. So I think you have, in, in, in this part of the thalamus, we have a very interesting group of nuclei which can act as you know, effective executives for, for cognitive function and engage certain regions of the brain or networks in the brain that are important for this higher order uh, processing, which mm. involves not just the neocortex, but also other structures that are important for decision making, that are important for memory consolidation and formation. So, so you think? Do you think then the thalamus has to be involved in those high-level decisions uh, when when you decide I'm going to do this or that today? Mm -hmm. It's got to be something in at that in its um, links to other parts of the brains at those high-level. 
I think so. Yeah. I think it's, it's particularly important in, in these higher order cognitive processes in yeah. which the processing goes beyond uh, the neocortex as well. It involves the neocortex, but yeah. it requires the coordination with other four brain structures. Right. And so the, the thalamus will be involved in the sensory processing, but particularly, I think, in, in these uh, higher order behaviors. Okay. What, what are you uh, excited about in the field right now? Uh, any new research or anything that uh, you want looking forward to? Well, I think um, there are lots of things uh, going on. I think in particular the research in, in, in thalamic areas is, is, is you know, getting these parts of the thalamus that uh, I've been mentioning which relate to cognitive function, they are getting more attention uh, as we keep studying what the hippocampus is doing, what the computations in the neocortex are. We, I think people are realizing that there is this missing piece in, mm -hmm. the, in the very complex puzzle, which is what, what the thalamus is doing. And so I think, that for me in particular, that, that's very exciting because I think yeah. we, we're going to learn a lot by integrating different structures and not just looking at individual components uh, separate, which is something that we've, we've done for a long time. So it sounds like the future is bright as far as trying to understand the thalamus because at least two of the other neuroscientists I have interviewed in this series have said, we don't know what the thalamus is doing. <laughs> There's still a big question mark there. Yeah. But it's great that, uh, that people are trying to figure it out. I mean, mm -hmm. this is one of the last frontiers of science and mm -hmm. the, the nuts getting cracked eventually we'll get there and we'll figure it we'll out. understand. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dr. Carmen Varela, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you, you for having me here. It's, it's been great. Thanks. Uh, and thank you all for watching Interview with, with the Neuroscientist. And we'll see you next time.